Well, this afternoon we have a wonderful opportunity to come to Matthew, and Matthew has been a tremendous, impactful book for my life because these are uh, really the story of Jesus and his own words as he ministered here on earth, and um, his words are impactful, his words are, are powerful, and we are especially in a sermon in which he's giving. Uh, the sermon which we will be in for quite a while, the Sermon on the Mount, and we're just getting started uh, at this moment. And we have been going through the Beatitudes and going through four of the Beatitudes of Jesus, as he has been explaining what it means to enter into the kingdom of heaven. We're going to be in the fourth, actually the fifth and the sixth one today, which is being merciful and being pure in heart. So let's read Matthew chapter 5, verse 7 through 8 this afternoon. And it says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Let's pray. Our Father, we are thankful for your word this afternoon. We're thankful that we get to engage in your word. We get to have your spirit work in us as we are contemplating your word. And we know, Lord, that your spirit at work in us is everything to us. We want to be inspired by you. We want to know where our lives are going. We want to hear from you. We want to be confident uh, in the direction of our lives. And so we do pray that you would lead us and guide us as we are uh, listening to your words so that uh, we would just better know you and have our lives be changed by you. Uh, We are thankful, Lord, and if we're um, burdened with something, Lord, may today or tonight's sermon or this afternoon's sermon uh, be of joy to us as we uh, hear from you, God, and that we may relieve our burden upon your hands, Lord, to give our burdens to you. We thank you, Lord. Just inspire us and lead us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Purity is something that which is highly valued in our world today. Uh, Many of you know that my wife's family lives in Indonesia, and Indonesia is a country that is quite uh, beautiful Uh, It is also quite abundant in its natural resources, but it is still very much a developing country in many sense, uh, many senses. It it really is a country where uh, there's so many things going on that as well, but one of the things that we have to be careful for is the water. The water is not always clean. Uh, You cannot always drink from the tab. You cannot always drink from the faucet. In fact, what you need to do is to make sure that the water you're drinking is from a bottle of water. That includes brushing your teeth and whatever that enters into your mouth because the water may be filled with bacteria. Uh, One time I remember I was uh, uncareful or not careful. I accidentally was brushing my teeth with faucet water as I would do here in America. And sure enough, I got sick the next day. And I was going to the bathroom. I was getting things passing out of me and all that stuff. Too much information, but... That was the reality of drinking impure water. So we want to drink water that is pure. We want to drink water that is just it, that's just water. Water, purity, is highly valued. But not only do we value things of which are physical nature, we know that in life we also value things which are of spiritual nature, things which are of our soul, things which are of our intention, and also of our relationship with God. The reality is this. None of us are completely pure. The reason why is because we have sinned against the holy and the righteous God. Romans chapter 3, verse 10 says that there is none righteous, not even one. Now, this does not mean that everything we do in this life is evil. No. We sometimes may have good intentions. There is still love and sacrifice here in this world, but The reality exists that in our lives, our intentions are never always completely pure. As a child, nobody has to tell me how to lie. I lied. As a child, nobody has to tell me how to be selfish. I was selfish. As a child, nobody has to tell me how to complain. I complained. Even though I did many good things, I also have done many bad things. And so to conclude, the nature of our lives is this is that we are impure. We're not perfectly evil or uh, completely evil, but we're not perfectly good. We're impure. The problem is that before God, we need to be perfectly pure. As I would not drink water which 
has been contaminated even to the slightest degree of bacteria, God also cannot accept us if we are not perfectly righteous. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, God said, Let us make man in our image. This means that we are made according to his likeness, not just in our being, in our ability, the fact that we are creative, the fact that we have emotions of love and compassion, etc., but we're created also after his holiness. We're created after his purity. We're created to be sinless as he is sinless. However, we, as we see in Scripture, we sin against God. And this is the reality of our lives, which is evident by our lives as well. Matthew chapter 15, verse 19 to 20 says, For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, and slander. And he added, Jesus added, these are what defiles a person. You may be a person sometimes of love, sometimes of compassion, sometimes of care, but then you also know that in your heart, and I know in my heart, there are evil thoughts, the thoughts of murder, thoughts of adultery, thoughts of sexual immorality, thoughts of theft, false witness, and slander. And I am, as you are, impure. And if we're impure before God, God cannot accept us. And if He's not accepting us, then we can only be at a place where He isn't, which is forever, eternity in hell. And that's not a good place. That's a place without anything that is beautiful, anything that's honorable, anything that is lovely, because everything that is lovely, everything that's honorable, everything that which we like in this world comes from God. That day we will be apart from all that. Our God, however, who loves us as we see in Scripture, has given to us a way to Himself, a way out of His wrath, and that is through the Son Jesus, who is the perfect life, a perfect life that is lived while He was on earth so that we would receive the righteousness which He lived. Jesus presented His perfect life to us. If we accept Him, and believe Him as our Lord and Savior, we can have His perfection. No longer are we impure, but we have become positionally pure because of Jesus. Even though we don't live perfectly, but we have been given the righteousness of God. Jesus then died on the cross. As He died on the cross, He was paying for the very punishment which is due us for our sins. Our punishment deserve, or our sins deserve punishment, but Jesus paid that for us us. Then he rose from the dead to show us that this is all done. This is all complete. If we believe unto him, he is the final salvation which we need. We will be forever with him. There is going to be no more salvation needed. All it requires is that we have faith in Christ and we will be there with him. This is the gospel message. As we believe in the gospel message, what we found is that we have been made pure in Christ by the mercy of of God. Positionally pure doesn't mean that everything we do is pure. We still sin from time to time. Doesn't mean that our thoughts are completely pure. We still may have evil thoughts from time to time, but when God sees us, He sees a pure life. To the degree in which we will say to Him that, God, I am willing to come to you now with a pure heart of claiming you as my Lord and Savior. You see, we're not necessarily those who are pure in our action, but there's a purity in us to the degree which we say, God, I do want you more than anything else in this world. I do want you more than anything which this world offers. This is what we're coming to in Matthew chapter 5. As we come to Matthew chapter 5, we're seeing Jesus displaying to us the characteristics of those who belong to the kingdom. If you belong to the kingdom, you will be, as Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, I believe starting from verse 3, poor in spirit. You will be, as Matthew chapter 5 verse 4 says, you will be those who are mourning over sin. As the next one says, you will be meek. You will also be hungry and thirsting after righteousness. These are the characteristics of those who believe in God, those who are kingdom citizens and The fifth one, which we see here today, is you will be merciful. You will be merciful because you have been given mercy, and because you are merciful, you will also be shown mercy. 
Verse 7 says this, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. As we come to this passage here in verse 7, what we're finding out is Jesus giving a sermon, a sermon to a crowd of people. Now, Jesus here in this ministry of his had been in the Galilee region for a season now. He is drawing a crowd. His ministry is composed of two elements, namely he was teaching and also he was healing. We see this in Matthew chapter 4, verse 23, in which he says he went throughout all Galilee, teaching in the synagogues and proclaiming all or proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. This is Jesus' ministry. He was teaching the gospel, how you may enter into the kingdom. And this is by believing onto him. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, we see Jesus saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He is the one who brings the kingdom of heaven. Not only so, he's also giving people glimpses of that kingdom. In that very kingdom, especially in the eternal kingdom, there will be no more pain, no more suffering, no more death. And so what Jesus was doing is that he's healing every disease and every affliction among the people. If you're lame, you can walk. If you're blind, you can see. If you're whatever it is you're struggling with, skin disease, leprosy, you will be healed. As a result, people were coming to him. Many people were coming to him because they loved his message. Perhaps more people were coming to him because Jesus actually was resolving them of the physical illness. Matthew chapter 4, verse 25 says, Great crowds followed him from Galilee and from Decapolis and from Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. I mean, people were coming to him from every place. And Jesus, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 1, saw the crowds. This is where the crowds are. Crowds are, are coming to him. Perhaps hundreds or thousands of people were coming to Jesus. Jesus saw the crowds. He realized that within this crowd, there are various intentions. Not everybody's pure about their intention for Jesus. Not everybody is here because they simply love the Savior. Some people are here because they simply wanted the blessings. As you imagine, if you never walked, now you could walk. You never saw it, you could see. And news is spread that this person can do this. Well, more and more people are coming. Jesus, however, had intention in his ministry. His intention isn't necessarily that you will be healed of a particular disease and die 30 years later and spend forever in hell. That's not what Jesus came to do. Jesus came to teach you how you may arrive in eternity with God, living a forever bliss, blessed life with Him. That's His purpose. So with this, what we found out was that Jesus began to separate Himself from this crowd. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 1, Jesus needed to make a delineation. He can't just stay there. There's just too many mixed motives, too many mixed emotions. So in Matthew chapter 5, verse 1, we see that he went up on the mountain. He walked away from the crowd, and he sat down, and sitting was the posture of those who were teaching. As he does this, people knew that he's about to say something, and those who are interested, not just in the physical healing of Jesus, came to him. In verse 1, it says his disciples, not the crowd, but his disciples, those who are within the crowd, came to Jesus to hear what Jesus has to say because they really want to develop a real, viable relationship with God. Not just a relationship where they receive benefits, but a real relationship. A, a, a relationship which they claim him as Savior, a relationship which he loves them and they love him. So, they came to hear him speak. The very first words Jesus said was here in verse 3. Blessed, happy are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We saw this. This is the first characteristic of those who belong to the kingdom of God. Blessed are you. Happy are you. Blessed because you are in the kingdom of God if you are poor in spirit, if you are poverty in spirit, if you experience this poverty, meaning that you yourself do not have any righteousness in and of yourself to offer to God, you believe. But the reason why you can go into heaven is entirely because of God's gift to you. So you beg, you beg. 
You're the publican in Luke chapter 18, verse 13, who says to God, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Then we saw the second beatitude, which is that blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are you who mourn. And this we saw was not mourning over the things of this world. The things of this world may have many things, many reasons, which we might mourn for. We may mourn for the death of a loved one. We may mourn for the loss of opportunity. We may mourn because someone took advantage of us. But all these mournings, and people mourn and mourn and mourn for a long time, they may not even ever stop mourning. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10 says that there's a mourning that leads to death. And people can mourn for a very long time. But this kind of mourning is the mourning of blessing. A morning where there is a resolution, a morning where there is finally, as Jesus said in verse 4, a comfort. Comfort. This is a morning specifically over sin. And 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10 says this there's a godly grief that produces repentance that leads to salvation without regret. If you mourn in this way, you will be without regret. You will be without sadness because God will comfort you. If you mourn over sin, the reality of sin, you know all that is paid for by the cross of Jesus Christ. You will arrive at the point in which you will be comforted. Revelation chapter 21 verse 4 says, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. So we're looking forward to this new life. Because we're mourning over sin, which we know will be one day conquered and defeated in the eternal day. Then there is, blessed are the meek. We saw this in Matthew chapter 5, verse 5. Blessed are those who are meek. And the reason why they're meek is not because of their personality. It's not because they're just gentle people to begin with. They're meek because they trust in God. People could take advantage of them. We saw this in Matthew chapter 5. Those who take advantage of them because... They're just weak, those who are forced to walk a mile, those who have their tunic taken from them, those who are slapped on the left cheek. Jesus says, let them, let them, because you know, you know that God will take care of you. Romans chapter 8, verse 28, we see the sovereignty of God in display, which Paul says we can trust in God through all the difficulties because we know that God loves us and those who love God. Amen. All things work together for good and for those who are called according to his purpose. We know we can trust in God. We don't have to fight for ourselves. God fights for us. And then there are those who are hungering and thirsting after righteousness. We saw that this is not a physical hunger, but this is a spiritual hunger. A spiritual hunger that says, I want God's righteousness. We saw that this is not a slice of righteousness in this world, but the totality of righteousness, the complete righteousness which will be experienced in heaven eventually, and now is even experienced on earth, which we have been given by Christ and His death for us. Even though we sin against God, we have been made righteous before God. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, we see God says, For our sake God made him, that is Christ, to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And we crave for that. We hunger for that. We want to be pure in such a way before God that we can't be accepted into his presence. And God says, Blessed are you because you will be filled. You will be satisfied. Jesus will provide this for you. And then with this, we arrive at the fifth beatitude, which is blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Merciful. What does it mean to be merciful? Now, when we look at the word mercy and do a quick study in the Bible, we know that the person who displays mercy most is God, right? God is the one who displays mercy. In fact, God calls himself a merciful God. Lamentations chapter 3, verse 22 to 23, we have this this description about God. It says, The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They're new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. His mercies are new every morning. That's who God is. He's a merciful God. 
Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 through 5, again, in the New Testament, it says, But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. It is because of His mercy we have been saved. Because of His mercy, we have been made alive in Christ. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, we see, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It is because of His mercy that we have been born again. And so we see God is a merciful God. Now, when we think about mercy, we might think, you know what, that just... Dole out mercy. God can just give mercy like that because He's a merciful God. And He can. But we must understand that at every point of giving out that mercy, mercy costs something to the person who gives it. Because there's a cost. There is something to be paid. Because you're saying you don't have to pay it back. I'm having mercy on you. So that means I must absorb the pain or I must absorb the cost. That is... The backdrop of mercy. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17, we see this description of mercy, which is made by Jesus to us, saying, Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. So God is saying this, Jesus is the merciful high priest, but throughout the book of Hebrews, what we find is that he himself was that propitiation. propitiation. He himself was that sacrifice, a body which you prepare for me. I'm going to go and give it for the sake of the brothers who I'm going to die for. Jesus, because of his mercy, had to pay the price. So there's always a price involved regarding mercy. Now, coming back to verse 7 here, saying, blessed are the merciful, the very same principle also applies. When you have mercy on another person, saying, hey, you don't have to do this, or I'm going to have mercy on you, I'm going to forgive you, what you are saying is that I'm going to absorb the pain. I'm going to absorb the cost. I'm going to absorb whatever I'm going to absorb so that you don't have to absorb it. That is the principle. It's not just... I'm going to forget about it. It's that I'm going to take on the cost. And if you do so, you are the merciful and you are blessed. You belong to the kingdom of God. You are a child of God if you do so because this is a characteristic of those who are saved, a characteristic of those who appreciate the very mercy which God has given them. You can see in the Old Testament, people who are merciful, again, not just God is merciful, but men are merciful. You see the story of Abraham. We talked about him last week, and we saw him and Lot had this confrontation, and, and it really not a confrontation because Abraham pretty much gave to Lot whatever Lot wanted, saying, you take the better land if you want to go there. Go ahead and go. That was what was in Genesis chapter 13. And in Genesis chapter 14, what we found is Lot was in trouble. Lot had been captured by some of the Canaanite kings, and Abraham could have said, you know what? He left me. He's not my responsibility anymore. He didn't want anything to do with me. He didn't want to be under my realm, my control, or my my rulership, or or just this family. He wanted to go on his own. Fine. It's not my problem. But you see, Abraham took Lot's problem to be his problem. In Genesis chapter 14, verse 14 to 16, we see Abraham let forth his trained men, boring his house, 318 of them, and went in pursuit as far as Dan. He tried to rescue Lot. He divided his forces against them by night, he and his servants, and defeated them and pursued them to Hobah, north of Damascus. Then he brought back all the possessions and also brought back his kinsmen, Lot, with his possessions and the women and the people. So Abraham really didn't have to do this, but he did. He did because he had mercy He took on the problem of Lot to be his own problem so that Lot could experience the benefit of his rescue. Another person who had mercy is David. David had mercy too, right, on Saul. Saul had tried to kill David numerous times, tried to make David 
will disappear from the face of the earth because Saul was jealous of David. David, however, continued to have mercy upon Saul. Time after time, there's one incident in which Saul himself was in the cave where David, and David was in the dark, so Saul didn't know, and Saul was relieving himself. And David could have killed Saul, and many of his men said, kill Saul now. Relieve yourself of this problem. Let this man die. He'll die in this cave, and none of his men will even know he was here. David wouldn't do it said, I would not strike the Lord's anointed. When Saul walked away after he reached a certain distance between him and David, David said to him in 1 Samuel chapter 24, verse 10, Behold, this day your eyes have seen how the Lord gave you today into my hand in the cave, and some told me to kill you. But I spared you, and I said, I will not put out my hand against the Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. He had mercy on Saul. See, the reason why mercy is such an important characteristic in our lives is because God has shown us mercy. And if we're appreciative of the very mercy which God has shown us, then we would also demonstrate that very same mercy to others because we are thankful. I think about a great story, right? In Matthew chapter 18, perhaps the most pertinent story that links the mercy of God to the very mercy which we demonstrate. The servant owed the master 10,000 talents. Could never ever pay it back. It's about 3.5 billions of dollars in today's money. He was called in by the master. The master said, you got to pay it back. If you don't, you're going to go to jail. The servant said, I cannot pay it back. I don't have the money. Please, please, give me some time. Time's not going to matter. <laughs> 3.5 billions is a lot of money work the rest of your life, it's not going to make a difference. So the master saw the servant. We saw this in Matthew chapter 18, verse 27. And out of pity for him, the master of the servant released him and forgave him of the debt. Say, you don't have to pay it. It's white clean. You're free to go. And the servant went out there and found another servant who owed him 100 denarii and said, pay it back now. Servant basically said the same thing to this servant who is asking for the money. Please give me some time. And this actually does make sense because 100 denarii, you could pay it back with some time. But this wicked servant would not give this other servant any time. In Matthew chapter 18, verse 30, it says he refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When the master heard this, he was angry. He was upset. He called in the servant and said in verse 32 to 34, I forgive you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant as had mercy on you? You should. You should. If you're thankful for what I have done for you, you should have done the same to others. See, this is displayed in the lives of those who are believers in the New Testament as well. You see, Stephen, after he was accused by the Sanhedrin to the sentence of death, and he was laying there as they were stoning him to death, he said in Acts chapter 7, verse 60, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. The very words of Jesus also as well, as he was crucified there on the cross, said, do not hold this sin against them. There's mercy in the heart of Stephen, also in the heart of Christ. We see this also in the believer's life at the end of the age when Israel is going to be persecuted by the Antichrist. And those who come alongside the nation of Israel are going to be those who are believers, those who have mercy upon that nation who have been persecuted or being persecuted. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 25, verse 34 to 36, he's going to say to those who came alongside the nation of Israel as they're being persecuted, come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for me, or prepared for you rather, from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger, you welcomed me. I was naked, you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, you came to me. Believers have mercy on others. And the righteous are going to say, when did we do this? You weren't here. 
Jesus said in verse 40, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of my brothers, you did it to me. There is a display of mercy. It's because we have received so much, we want others to receive the benefits of what we have received. Because we have been given mercy, we want others to receive mercy as a display of the tremendous love which we have been given by God. So we see here that mercy is an important characteristic, important characteristic in the life of a believer. We're going to go. We're going to demonstrate this. We're not going to walk around and just turn a blind eye. James chapter 2, verse 15 to 17. Again, we talked about it this morning. James says, if a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warm and filled, but without giving them the things they need, what good is that? No. Jim says, by faith itself, if it does not have works, it's dead. If you say you love, if you say you have mercy, if you say that you cling to God for salvation, but you do not demonstrate this in your own life to others, how can you say you really understood what God has done for you? But for those of us who are believers, we do understand. So therefore, we will live it out. So mercy is an important characteristic in the life of a believer. And with that, we move to the next one. It's not just merciful you have to be. You also are pure in heart. Pure in heart. Verse 8. It says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So this is the sixth beatitude. Sixth beatitude. You're pure in your heart. Now, when we think about the word purity, we might have a different understanding of this. We think, oh, we have to be pure in the sense that we're sinless. No, none of us are sinless. You don't get into heaven being sinless. I mean, you're sinless in the sense that Christ had died for you. He's given you his perfect righteousness, but you'll never be sinless. You'll never be completely pure in your heart because we still do sin from time to time. Well, this word pure is word catharsis, which is how we get the word catharsis. Catharsis. And when we think about catharsis, it's not a word which we use typically. Uh, it's really a, a word which defines our process to cleanse us of our emotions or thoughts which we don't want. When you go through a catharsis process, you're cleansing yourself of any emotional thoughts which you don't want, like things are evil, things are bad, or things which are bothering you, things in the past, which are your baggages hanging you down, and you just say, I can't just forget about that, can I just not think about that? That's why you go to counselors, that's why you go to therapists, and you're trying to perform a catharsis in a sense. So you want to be pure. You want to have one-mindedness about you, and that's a good thing. James chapter 1, verse 6 through 8, it there's a phrase in there saying that the, the man who doubts is like a wave of the sea that's driven and tossed by the wind. You, you don't want to be doubtful. You don't want to be doubtful in your decision. You want to be doubtful in your life. You want to be confident. So you want to be pure. But then you want to be pure in your heart. When we think about the heart, we tend to think about our emotion, how we feel. But for the Jewish people, the heart actually is the intellectual processing center of their being. The bowels actually was how they feel. They felt in their bowels, but they thought with their heart. That is the difference between the Jewish definition of heart versus the American or the Western definition of heart. And what Jesus is saying here is this. You want to be pure in your intentions. You want to be pure in your decisions. You want to be pure in your thinking. You want to be pure in how you're processing life. And there are many people who are not pure, at least in their relationship with God. We see purity is important as far as how you perceive God and your relationship with Him to be. Back in those days, there were the Pharisees. The Pharisees were not pure in their emotions at all, nor are they pure in their intellectual decisions. Jesus rebuked them for being hypocrites. Being a hypocrite means that you're not pure because you have double-minded intentions. They were hypocrites in their giving. Matthew chapter 6, verse 2, 
Jesus said, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the street, so that they may be praised by others. So you have the Pharisees who are giving. Some of them may say, well, I'm giving to God, but part of them are saying, you know what, it's nice for me to give in this way because other people get to see me give and I will look so much more better in the eyes of others. That is not a pure intention of giving. So don't do that. Don't give in that way. Give in secret, Jesus said. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 5, there is also the praying. When you're praying, you're dedicating your heart to God. Only God should see, but for the Pharisees, they're praying for people to see. He says, when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and the street corners so that they may be seen by others. So you have here a description of impure motives. They're praying, part of them saying, okay, I'm praying to God, but then part of them are saying, you know what, I want other people to respect me. They're not pure in their intentions. And they're also not pure in their fasting. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 16, Jesus said, when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure the faces that their fasting may be seen by others. So you have here a, a, a spiritual discipline of fasting, which should be done to God and God alone. Jesus said, when you fast, wash your face, right? Comb your hair, do whatever it takes so that you look normal, so people don't see, so that when you're doing, you're actually doing it for God and God alone. Do not function with mixed motives. And certainly there are so many people who are functioning with mixed motives even today in Jesus' own ministry right here in the crowds. People are coming to him because they want the healing, they want the blessings, they want the food, but they don't really want Jesus. Now, you, you ask them, they say, well, I want Jesus too. Of course we want Jesus. But you see, they're not completely pure in their intentions. After Jesus made them food in John chapter 6, and there are likely 20,000 of them because there are 5,000 men and with their children and the women, there are 20,000 people. People are coming to him in John chapter 6, verse 15, to take him by force to make him king. Why? It is because Jesus can make food. And when you stop making food, they what? Walked away. Walked away. They don't really want Jesus. They may say they want Jesus, but the reality is that they don't really want Jesus. They're coming with mixed motives. They want the Jesus that can produce them food. So Jesus says here, you need to be pure in heart regarding your devotion to God. What is it that is causing you to come to him? Is it because he's providing certain blessings? Is it, do you come to church or do you go to Jesus because you feel that your life will be more blessed because you do? Or because, I don't say that's a good motive. I think that's a mixed motive. Or is it because you simply love Jesus because you do love him? And that is it. That is it. I think that's what Jesus is looking for. In verse 8, he said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And everything what Jesus said before should apply to this verse. Your pure in heart in your devotion of being poor in spirit. Your pure in heart in your devotion of mourning over your sins. Your pure in heart in your devotion of being meek before God. Your pure in heart in your hungering or thirsting after righteousness. Your pure in heart in being merciful. Your pure in heart in the sense that you want God and that's it. You don't have to have anything else. As psalmist in Psalm chapter 73, verse 26 says, My flesh and my heart may fail. My life may fall apart. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. I just want him. If you want God in this way, then Jesus says, you will see God. You will see God. And that's a blessing. Every single one of the tag-along line in the Beatitudes is a blessing. To them shall belong the kingdom of heaven. That's a blessing. They shall be comforted. That's a blessing. They shall inherit the earth. That's a blessing. They shall be satisfied. That's a blessing. They shall receive mercy. That's a blessing. They shall see God. That's a blessing. But how is that a blessing? How is seeing God a blessing? Well, in the Old Testament, we know that people want to see God. People ask to see God. In fact, Moses wanted to see God. In that difficult ministry of Moses, Moses asked in Exodus chapter 33, verse 18, please show me your glory. Show me who you are. Show me your face. Show me. And, and the pre-incarnate Christ said 
in Exodus chapter 33, verse 20, you cannot see my face, for no man shall see me and live. I'm going to have to protect you from this. Now, people want to see God because there's a certain sense of reassurance that what they're going through right now is good and according to his will, and God will energize them. The same thing that happened to Philip. Philip, after hearing about the crucifixion of Jesus and Jesus is going to die and Jesus is going to leave them, said in John chapter 14, verse 8, Lord, just show us the Father and that will be enough for us. You know what? If you just show us the Father, I can go through that just to show us the Father. And Jesus said, you see me. You see the Father. So we want to see God. I think there's a beauty in this. Because once you see God, you are reassured that what you're going through is going to turn out just fine because God is with you in this. But seeing God also is a very terrifying thing. Every person who asked to see God, who eventually saw God, got scared and was in fear of their lives. Isaiah chapter 6, we see Isaiah seeing God. Isaiah saw God high and lifted up sitting on the throne with the train of his robe in the temple. And he said in verse 5, Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell among the men of unclean lips, and I've seen the Lord God Almighty. Woe is me. It's not such a happy experience. I'm, I'm scared. Witness. Job also did the same thing. He wanted to talk with God, wanted to debate with God. And God says, here I am. I'm going to debate with you. And Job just dwindled. Said in chapter 42, verse 5 through 6, I now heard of you, or I heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you, and therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. He got scared. But yeah, there's something beautiful. I mean, it's a beautiful, scary thing, I would say. In a sense that once you see God, you're assured of the direction which he has for you. And this happened to Peter. See, I don't think this is seeing God in the sense that we have to see him like Jesus standing right there. I mean, I don't know, some people claim that they did that, but I think that this is seeing God in his glory in the spirit, in the sense that you finally see what he's doing in your life. I think Peter did see this. Man, Peter saw Jesus in his humanity. Jesus looked like any other person. Peter probably met Jesus even before Jesus' ministry and just saw Jesus as a regular carpenter no better than anyone else. And Jesus now is starting his ministry, and finally Peter is recognizing that Jesus is the Messiah. We saw this in John chapter 1, when Andrew's brother brought Peter, and Jesus said, you shall be called Cephas. And Peter met Jesus and recognized that this man is a prophet, or this man is doing the ministry of God. That's the first call. But Peter had not completely yet followed Jesus. He went back to his job, his fishing and in Matthew chapter 4, what we saw also is Jesus calling Peter, Andrew, James, and John again. They dropped their nets, followed him, but they have not yet completely followed him. They just followed him temporarily or just for longer periods of time, but they still went back fishing because we saw a third call in Luke chapter 5. Jesus doing his ministry. He met up with Simon Peter. Simon Peter is mending the nets on the boat, and Jesus said, hey, can I borrow your boat? I'm going to teach this crowd right here, and it's better if I could just move away from the shore a little bit on your boat so they can all hear me. And Simon Peter said, that's great. Let's do this. So Jesus preached. People heard. The sermon is done. People scattered, went back to their home. Peter, oh, Jesus turned around, said to Peter, hey, Peter, how's it going? Just having a casual conversation. Oh, you know what? It hasn't been going so good. Why not? Well, I've been fishing. Oh, how's fishing been? You always go back fishing. I've been calling you to come and follow me, but you've been fishing. You don't want to come follow me. You just want to stick with your job, what you're feeling secure with. And Peter said, well, you know, I know, but you know, it's kind of hard. You know, I got to provide for family. I got to do this and that. And Jesus said, well, how was fishing last night? Well, it's hard. I couldn't catch any fish. Well, that's a bummer. Why don't you drop it right now in the sea and see what you can catch? Peter said, hey, Master, we've been fishing all night long. It's not going to happen. But since you commanded us to do it, we will do it right now. Drop the net, 
So much fish in the net, couldn't pull it up. You got to get another boat to come and help them pull it up. And Peter had a very interesting response to Jesus. Seeing this, he said in Luke chapter 5, verse 8 to Jesus, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man. How in the world is catching fish causing you to say to Jesus, Departing from me, I'm a sinful man? It is because he saw Jesus at a greater light he's never seen before. Saw Jesus as God. Right? Because you wouldn't say, Depart from me, unless Jesus was God, that he was holy, that he's righteous, and I'm sinful. So with this, we saw in Luke chapter 5, eventually in that very story, they dropped everything after they came and pushed the boat to the shore. They dropped everything and followed Jesus. Changed this life after seeing Jesus in his proper light. So we see here, we want to see God. In the New Testament, we see Paul seeing God. Paul is complaining about his life. I have this thorn in the flesh so hard. Ask, the, ask God to take it away three times. And God answered him. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, my grace is sufficient for you and my power is made perfect in weakness. God answered him. I changed his perspective. So Paul said in verse 10, for the sake of Christ then, I am content now with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities, but because when I am weak, then I am strong. I'd rather embrace that weakness because I want more and more of that Christ which I saw in me. I want more of his power. I want more of his grace. And he also says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17, this light, light, momentary affliction, is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. It's only light. It's only momentary compared to the eternal weight of glory, which I've seen. I've gone to the third heaven. I've seen that. Everything I do is worthwhile. So would you want to have this perspective of Jesus? Would you want to see Jesus more in your life? I think I would. I think how we see Christ is through his word. It's not waiting for a dream or a vision, but his word displays who he is to us. Psalm chapter 119, verse 105 says, Your word is a lamp unto my feet and light unto my path. Read God's word. Read the gospels. Read Paul's letters. Read all the scripture and see Christ displayed in all the scripture and his love, mercy, and grace. And the Holy Spirit uses the scripture to display to you how Christ is in your life, how he's caring for you, how he's taking care of you, how he's leading you how he's instructing you. You're seeing that. You're seeing him walking with you every step of the way as you read his word because his word confirms the situations which you're going through in life and the decisions you're making. That is the decisions which pleases him. And as you do so, as you read God's word, you begin to put away sinful things in your life, sinful attitudes or sinful actions. Because you want to conform your life more and more to God. That's part of what it means to see God. Isaiah saw God. He said, I'm a man of unclean lips, right? He no longer is going to speak with unclean lips. After he's been cleansed by God, after he has been forgiven by God, after he cries out to God for saving grace, for mercy, after he receives that, he's going to live his life more and more according to the likeness of God. That's what it means also to see God. Colossians chapter 3, verse 5, we see we're to put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. And then with this, we're to put on holiness. In verse 12, it says that we're to put on compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. That's what it means to see God. As we see God, we are even more and more grateful of the mercy which is given to us because the more we see God, the more we see how undeserving we are and how sinful we are. The closer you get to the light, the more you see your own imperfections and sins. When you're away from the light, yes, you're not so clear. Of course, you can't see too much of yourself. 
nor can you see so much of your own sins, but the more close you are to the light, the more you see your imperfection, the more you see your sin, the more you're thankful for the mercy and the grace which God's given to you, and the more that you want to make those changes in your lives for the glory of God. And when other people see you, you can say this is all part of the mercy and the grace of God. That's why believers are called to be merciful because they have received mercy. Believers are to be pure in heart because they truly desire God above everything else. You see, that purity isn't that we're completely pure in every action or every thought. None of us are. But there's a purity saying that I want God more than anything else. That is pure. That is a pure intention of a believer. I think the old Puritan prayer called the Valley of Vision describes this process perfectly, and it says, Lord, high and holy, meek and lowly, thou hast brought me to the valley of vision where I live in the depth, but see thee in the heights. Hemmed in by the mountains of sin, I behold thy glory. Let me learn by paradox that the way down is the way up, that to be low is to be high, that the broken heart is the healed heart, that the contrite spirit is the rejoicing spirit, that the repenting soul is the victorious soul, that to have nothing is to possess all, that to bear the cross is to wear the crown, that to give is to receive, that the valley is the place of vision. Do we feel that way? See, we, we're hemmed in, as the Puritan says, by the mountains of sin. I'm stuck, but I look up. And I see your glory. What a beautiful phrase. It's not that we're perfect, but in the light of my struggles, in the light of my own sin, in the light of my impurity, in the light of the fact that I'm in this valley, I can look up and see Christ even more glorious in saving me. That is the pure heart that Jesus wants us to have. Psalm chapter 73, verse 25, 26. Again, we say, along with the psalmist, whom have I in heaven but you? And there's nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Let us be our prayer. Let's pray. Our Father, we are thankful that we get to investigate this beatitude or these two, pure in heart and merciful. We're thankful that these two are very much interconnected. And we pray that we would live it out, Lord. We know that we don't live perfect lives, but there is something pure about us, which is that we desire your mercy. We desire your grace. So lead us, Lord, to come to you always, to claim grace and mercy at your feet. We thank you, Lord, that you will give it as we'll pour in spirit before you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.